世界は一つにメッシマジー This spring, a fashion show like no other. This kimono with a Parthenon image represents Greece. And this one, Italy. The Renaissance motifs are tweaked into a novel design. Each kimono represents countries from around the world. The mastermind of this show is Yoshimasa Takakura, who runs a kimono shop. Takakura has launched an unprecedented project to create a kimono. For every country in the world. He named it Imagine One World Kimono Project. Takakura's dream. Tokyo!、Yeah! The 2020 Tokyo Olympics. For the opening ceremony, he'd like to see placard bearers modeling these kimono. The art of the kimono is in danger of disappearing. Artisans are aging rapidly, and fewer people are wearing the traditional garment. To reverse the trend, Takakura is calling on artisans young and old from all around Japan to come together to create new kimono styles. In 2020, I want Japanese people to realize that kimono culture is in fact their culture, and I want them to recognize that. My aim is to start a movement, a movement that won't fade away, but rather will endure for the next 100 years. The 2020 deadline is just two years away. We follow Takakura on his quest to bring new life to an old tradition. This global project began in a small city in southwestern Japan, in a modest kimono store that looks far from revolutionary. Choya was established 80 years ago. Yoshimasa Takakura is its third generation owner. He has inherited his family's pride in selling kimono crafted by top artisans. This young woman is selecting a long sleeved piece for her coming of age ceremony. A famous artisan created this vivid dyed pattern with embroidered accents. っていう成長したんだなっていうのを感じたんで、今日は非常にあの見ていて喜ばしい日でしたね。これはジョンちゃんが着るんだ、可愛いね。タカクラス clients often pass down their kimono from generation to generation. This girl's kimono, made at Choya 30 years ago, belonged to her mother. Today, she's getting a coat to wear with it for a children's festival. 
a fine quality kimono is a family treasure. Takakura is determined to do what he can to maintain this tradition. <laughs> The reality, however, is not so promising. Consumers of traditional kimono have dramatically declined in recent times. Kimono store sales nationwide have plunged, more than 80% of what they were 30 years ago. Kyoto is the center of kimono production. Even here, where Takakura buys his goods, a sense of crisis is setting in. He visits a kimono manufacturer that's been in business since 1925. Owner Yasunori Yamada heads a major Kyoto kimono manufacturer's organization. He says the outlook is bleak for members. Many artisans and manufacturers have been forced to close due to lack of demand. His company produced this kimono. But he says such elaborate work from the hands of seasoned artisans is becoming harder to produce. If you look closely, you can see the color changes very subtly, even within patterns. This is called the bokashi style. Artisans capable of this technique are rare nowadays. There are probably fewer than 10 in my organization, if the truth be told. We want to find a way to preserve and pass on Japan's kimono-making techniques. This combination of artistry and technical prowess is something we all can be proud of. But the situation gives us very little hope. This Kyoto workshop once had 50 artisans working on its looms. However, unable to recruit new employees, it was forced to close. Yeah, this is hardly an isolated case. It's being repeated not just in Kyoto, but across Japan. Especially over the last 10 years, I've had a sense that kimono-related work can't carry on much longer. There's very little we can do to save it. When a situation spirals out of control like this, we have two choices. We can either give up, or we can try one more time and give it everything we've got. Takakura was resolved to try one more time and give it his all. He staged a small fashion show in Tokyo to share his idea with industry colleagues. He had kimono representing six countries created for the occasion. This is South Africa, 
represented by a splendid field of flowers. All these flowers actually bloom in South Africa. A special dyeing technique expresses them beautifully. The Kingdom of Bhutan. The red and yellow colors leave a striking impression. At the end of the show, Takakura makes a bold announcement. It was ambitious, the declaration of the Imagine One World Kimono Project. Tokyo! Yeah! Takakura was inspired when Tokyo was chosen for the 2020 Olympics. He had been watching a TV program about the 1964 Tokyo Games. He marveled at the footage of young women presenting medals. They were all wearing long-sleeved kimono. I noticed they were wearing very high-quality kimono. I did some research and found out that these were their own personal garments. What a surprise! Even looking at them half a century later, I felt the designs were terrific and the kimono were beautiful. I wondered what kind of kimono would be on display in 2020. So, I decided to create another concept that would be just as appealing as the 1964 Olympics. Together with a large group of people, some with outstanding technical skills, others with fine taste and sensitivity, we could create our own unique kimono that might even outshine those from 1964. And I think we can achieve that. Financing, of course, is a major obstacle. Producing a high-quality kimono and obisash costs about 20,000 US dollars. Multiplying that by about 200 kimono for all countries and regions translates to about four million dollars. Takakura traveled across Japan seeking support from businesses and communities, as well as government organizations. Takakura's project grew slowly but steadily. He even started launching events overseas. And people responded. Companies too. They signed on as sponsors and locals formed teams to raise funds. Takakura scours the country to find master artisans for his kimono. Kisaburo Ugawa is a renowned textile artisan, one of only ten national living treasures in his field. Ogawa is a master of Hakata Kenjo, a silk weaving style with a history of nearly 800 years. He specializes in crafting obi sashes. Hakata Kenjo obi were prized by the samurai class. They loved their simple design. 
Hakata Kenjo is defined by four fixed patterns and a minimal color palette for a less is more aesthetic. Ogawa has been faithful to this orthodox approach for more than 60 years. He's fiercely guarded it. Yet Takakura asks him to undertake something entirely different. An obi to complement an elaborate kimono. But normally a Hakata Kenjo obi would never be paired with this kimono type. <laughs> Hakata Kenjo Obi style is not so opulent. It's very simple. Of course, I can make a decorative Obi. However, it's not what I've been doing. So I will keep the foundation of Hakata Kenjo while working hard to create a new work for the project. Takakura purposely challenged Ogawa. He felt the expertise of a national living treasure would lead to innovation. In order to propel a culture forward, it's important to do things you've never experienced. By taking on something they have never accomplished in their work, artists and artisans give birth to new designs. Stepping up to the challenge also points them in new directions of styles and skills. Ogawa was asked to work on an obi for Canada. He held discussions with local textile artisans to flesh out the designs. They turned to images from Canada for inspiration. Ogawa was taken with the colors of the country's nature. But he struggled with how to translate them into the simplicity that defines Hakata Kenjo. ナイアガラの滝うん。っていうのもやっぱカナダのですね。一つの名所なので、この内側の滝のこの流れをこの島で表してみるとか。グリーンでもグリーンに中にでこのグリーンに白っていうのはあまり入れないな。写真で入るけ
、緩んでるんですよ。こう、いとこんなやつですよ。こう。いとこ、こんなほう、なんか、見られてるでしょいとこ,こ。ああ、あ、ここの、ここですね。ね緩んできてるでしょあそうなんだ、はい。だから、もう目は離せないんですよ。Ogawa makes minute adjustments to the positions of the loom's weights to correct the problem. He uses intuition acquired from decades of experience. Ogawa can only weave about 60 centimeters a day as the design is more complex than usual. Two weeks after starting, Ogawa finally completes the obi. He conjured up Canada's diverse landscape through his signature minimalist expression. The central red patterns represent Canada's symbol, the maple leaf. Flanking them, the white torrent of the Niagara Falls. Both patterns shimmer as if illuminated from within. Ogawa's delicate yet dramatic red gradation reflects the northern lights. The vivid Canadian kimono will now be styled with Ogawa's Hakata Kenjo Obi for the first time. Lustrous patterns and delicate gradations. Perfect to enhance the beauty of the elaborate kimono. Yeah, I'm just amazed. This is a miracle. 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 作りがいがありましたね。私は最高級だけどね。Ogawa decides to show the obi to students at a textile school that he's affiliated with. The consensus: the master has outdone himself. Ogawa hopes his new obi will motivate students to carry Hakata Kenjo artistry into the future. のでそれとまた小川先生作られたものが全然また違う感じのものだったのでこういうことかと先生がそういうふうに間口を広げてくださるっていうのがあるから好きにやってもいいのかなっていうのは思いました When Takakura saw the students' expressions, he knew he was right to ask Ogawa to work outside of his realm. Ogawa came up with a new style, 
Just looking at it tells us all we need to know, much more than any verbal explanation could provide. I think succeeding generations can discern from this Ogawa's stature as a man of tradition looking toward the future. I think it has a deep and important meaning for all of us involved with kimono. In midsummer, the Gion Festival lends a festive air to Kyoto. Takakura shows up to take it in. Kyoto is home to the country's top kimono makers. Many of them are participating in Takakura's project. He is visiting Okaju, a 160-year-old kimono company. Shigeo Okajima is the fourth generation CEO. Takakura commissioned him to make an Indonesia themed kimono. The kimono took nearly a year to complete. Countless tiny white arabesque patterns light up the kimono's deep red background. Traditional kimono techniques alone could not have produced this result. Okajima's company produces kimono in the kyoyuzen style, a dyeing technique that has its roots in Kyoto. Kyoyuzen is often characterized by its pale gradations and soft outlines. A unique approach is behind this appearance. Before dyeing, glue is applied around the outline of the preliminary sketch. Next, the sketch is colored in, with the glue acting as a barrier so the colors don't bleed. The glue is light and sits on the surface, so, strong colors might bleed if dyeing is done too intensely. That's why Cure Yuzen tends to favor pale colors. For the project, Okajima turned to Indonesian batik in a nod to its culture and to innovate on the Cure Yuzen style. Using batik techniques allow for rich, saturated colors. ちょっとこう少し厚めに塗られてるとこと少し薄くなってるところと同じ合いがこの色のノーターに出てるっていうことで。それが手の塗り。手の塗り。手の塗り。手の塗り。手の塗り。手の塗り。手の塗り。手の
melted wax is used to outline the preliminary sketch. Wax and glue have different properties when placed on cloth. Glue rests on the surface, while wax penetrates it, creating a thick barrier. That's why bright colours bleed when glue is used, but cannot penetrate a wax barrier, allowing for distinct outlines. Okajima and Iman are discussing their kimono project collaboration. Iman's apprentice applies wax on the preliminary drawing that Okajima prepared in Kyoto, along with something more. Iman and his team have added wax lines in tiny floral patterns that were not in the original drawing. Saya mengalami masuk ke dunia yang berbeda dari saya dan saya bisa mengenal sedikit lebih mengenal ya bahwa dulu juga sudah mengenal tapi sekarang sedikit bertambah lagi mengenal tentang Jepang. Once Iman and his team had finished applying the wax, they sent the kimono back to Kyoto for dyeing. A deep burgundy red and clearly defined flower emerges. The Indonesian-themed kimono is finally complete. Its dark red and white colors represent the Indonesian flag. Here, batik techniques and the delicate arabesque pattern that Iman proposed. The country's many islands and traditional motifs. The sharp contrast of strong red outlines and soft colors is something new for the kimono tradition. I wanted to create a kimono that has two elements, a deep red through Indonesian batik and the beauty of Yuzen's color gradation. To me, this kimono represents strength. I'm delighted to see my dream realize. When two cultures collide, a new culture is born. After studying about how Indonesians use color and what they think is beautiful, in other words, their aesthetic, these helped create a new, refreshed style of kimono. I think they proved that to me, which was very significant and very inspiring. Takakura initially brought in the top kimono artisans for his project, but once it gained traction, he set out to discover new talent to cultivate a younger generation. He put out the word on social media. An up-and-coming artisan responded. Impressed, Takakura arranged to meet her in Kyoto. <laughs> Mutsumi Okuno has been creating kimono for nine years, but is still establishing herself. That doesn't stop Takakura from signing her on to his kimono project. Yes. 
はいってすごいはっきり言わせてたからなかなかいないですよ<笑>な、な、本当に入って答えたんですかはい、あります、うん、じゃないと、あの、ここまでやってこれないです、うん、そりゃそうだよ Okino convinced Takakura she has what it takes to stand alongside the luminaries he had already assembled. Of course, I took a risk. The other side of the coin is this gives promising young creators a lot of room for growth. Without them making kimono, we're finished. If we leave everything up to veterans, well, in four to ten years, they might be gone. So one of our most important goals is providing opportunities to the next generation. Okuno has been working at a Kyoyu Zen workshop. She majored in Japanese painting at an art university before turning to kimono design. This is my first piece to win a prize. It's a camellia, a winter flower. I visualized the season when I made it. Okuno has won prizes in competitions for local artisans. Her signature is botanicals in pale colors in the traditional Kyoyuzen style. Okuno hopes that taking part in Takakura's project will allow her to explore new forms of expression. I feel a lot of pressure, but I have a strong desire to express my own vision. I'm not sure how the piece will turn out, but I'm giving it my all. Takakura assigned her to work on the Eastern European country of Belarus. Collecting enough information to get underway was a formidable challenge. I thought it wouldn't be a problem with the internet and all, but there was nothing in Japanese, so I didn't know where to begin. Okuno made a breakthrough. She met Nia, an exchange student from Belarus. <laughs> Nia has brought along a traditional Belarusian costume. <laughs> These red and white patterns are traditional motifs. Nia also shows Okuno a video. A rock band wearing traditional folk clothing sing in Belarusian. Most people in Belarus speak Russian, so the local language is losing out. The band wants to counter this trend. ただ、なんて言えばいいかな。難しいな。うん。ロシア人とかと違う文化の部分というのが、なんだか、もう田舎臭くて、その言語が、言語がいなくさいっていうのが絶対にない。でも、なんとなくもうどっか見えないところで、
Nier's stories give Okuno a dose of inspiration. Her design is bold. She celebrates the red of Belarusian folk dress in the wide hem. She also incorporates the national bird, the stork. And in the center, a circular motif with a Belarusian poem that Nia has selected. It features a weaver who speaks of her passion and pride for her country. My thoughts completely changed as I learned about Belarus. The limits I thought were holding me back disappeared. I was able to look past them and create a piece that is different from everything else I have made before. Takakura stops by to see how things are going. なんかね。it's been four years since Takakura embarked on his project. He's reached a milestone, 100 kimono. But that's only half. In April, he staged a major event in his hometown to show the first 100 kimono to his supporters. He invited 100 volunteer models to join the show. The world is filled with beautiful things. Many of them appear in these kimono. When you go on stage, I'd like you to hold the wishes and hopes of the people of these countries in your hearts. Joining hands at the end of the show will be the moment the world unites. It's my dream, the goal I'm determined to reach. On the day of the show, All the kimono appeared in the same place at the same time, for the first time. Each with its own story. This is a kimono for the United Kingdom, made by a promising female artist from Kyoto. English roses are sprinkled across a London nightscape. 
characters from the James Bond movie series and Alice in Wonderland are also incorporated into the design. The kimono representing Vietnam was made by a young Tokyo kimono dyer. He portrayed the 54 ethnic groups in the country. The children symbolize its future. The kimono featuring Canada, a national living treasure honored his simple Hakata Kenjo style, but added a feminine touch to his obi sash. Even this master pushed his boundaries to reach a new style. The kimono that fuses traditional artistry from Indonesia and Japan. Bridging batik techniques with Kyo Yuzen has created new potential for the kimono. When tradition meets tradition, innovation is born. The finale. Takakura always looks ahead and tries to create new things. He impresses me. I hope the project will expand and reach audiences abroad. I'm sure these kimono will make people happy around the world. Since the show, Takakura has received sponsorship offers from more firms and interest from kimono makers who want to get involved. Each of these 100 kimono has given our industry and its people confidence. The more we advance, the more confidence we get. But we are still only halfway there. I can begin to see a future for kimono beyond this project. If we get things right, it's possible that the prospects for kimono will once again be bright. For now, though, the focus is on 2020. Takakura is running in a race of his own, another 100 kimono in time for the opening ceremony. His ambitious quest to have people worldwide see the kimono with fresh eyes is transforming an ancient garment into a borderless icon.